Another Thanksgiving day. The sheriff knocks on the door, but not on official business. He came to visit his friends. He is greeted by his friend Mitch and his wife Amanda, Jessica, her stepmother Kathleen, her father Thomas, the owner of the Wright Mart supermarket, are also gathered around the table. Mitch carves a traditional turkey, but he doesn't have time to eat. It's time to go to work. He works as a salesman at Wright Mart, where the owner, on the advice of his wife, is preparing to launch a sale, Black Friday. Crowds are already rushing to the store to buy goods at a discount. Jessica chats with her boyfriend Bobby, a local baseball star known for his phenomenal golden hand. Their football player friends, Evan and Scuba, and their girlfriends Gabby and Julia, come to pick them up. Evan brags about getting into a fight with the boys from Hanover High. In the fight, the guy got his phone smashed instead of his face so the company goes to the supermarket to get a new one. Bobby lags behind, taking selfies with fans. Jessica meets Ryan, a guy who has a crush on her. Sensing the threat of the alpha male, the baseball player catches up to the girl and leads her away from her rival. Using her family connections, Jessica lets her friends into the store through the back door. This infuriates the other shoppers, including the athlete from Hanover. Sheriff and Amanda arrive at the store to visit Mitch. They are frightened by an aggressive crowd, angry that the golden youth are already inside. The sheriff calms the crowd with a megaphone Phone, but the bully grabs the device and yells that the store is open. The crowd rushes the doors, tears down the fence, and knocks down a police officer. The fat guard rolls away for safety. Amanda tells the second guard to open the door. As he fumbles with the keys, the crowd pushes forward, but the glass door fails and falls on the guard. Dozens of people rush in, unaware that they are trampling a living person. One visitor in the crush cuts his neck with a protruding shard of glass. Evan climbs onto the counter and films the madness happening on his phone. Someone pushes Amanda. She falls to the floor dropping the casserole. Another customer slips on the sludge. People trashing boxes feel free to fight each other. As the stampede continues, more and more people are injured. Scuba protects the fallen Julia, and Bobby tries to help the wounded guard, but for some reason, he does it crawling, for which he pays the price, getting his arm broken. Amanda is less lucky, getting hit in the head by two carts at once. The cartwheelers push, tangling her hair around the wheel and ripping a chunk of her scalp from her skull. In the midst of a fighting mob, Mitch finds his wife in a pool of blood. The sheriff appears next, and after counting the wounded, he picks up a gun and shoots into the ceiling. The story moves forward a year. The tragedy at Wright Mart has become a viral video on YouTube, but no one ever went to jail. The store is planning another holiday sale, which isn't everyone's cup of tea. Mitch blames the Wrights for what happened. They say they saved on security by limiting it to two people. At the diner, the sheriff tells his new deputy that the townspeople are dressing up as pilgrims for the holiday and wearing a mask of the state's first governor, John Carver. At the fair, her stepmother reminds Jessica that it's time to record a traditional commercial with her father. However, Carver's house, where they usually do it, has been attacked by vandals. Ryan goes to meet Jessica. Bobby left after the incident, so now Ryan is dating her. A girl hangs out with friends at a coffee shop where a classmate is selling tickets to a party for local smart hustler McCarthy. Jessica thinks she sees Bobby, but he leaves immediately. The guys receive a message from John Carver's fake account, a photo of a holiday table that marks them all. Little do they know that somewhere in the lair, a mysterious stranger is watching a YouTube video of the tragedy and sharpening a weapon. In the evening as the diner closes, a waitress involved in a holiday crush is attacked by an unknown man dressed as John Carver. After dunking the woman in the sink, the attacker leans her against the open freezer door, forcing her to peel off her skin to free herself. She dodges an axe blow and runs. In the utility room, she tries to unlock her phone, but the facial recognition doesn't work. She runs out into the parking lot and sees a stranger driving a car. He chases her to the dumpster. While trying to hide inside, the woman is hit by a lid that cuts her in half. In the morning, the bottom half is found on the Right Mart logo next to the 50% off banner. At school, the young people get a new message from John Carver. Signs with their names appeared on the table. Despite the incident, Wright has no plans to cancel the sale, which Jessica tells her worried friends. On their way out of the school, they are approached by McCarthy, who offers to stock up on guns for self-defense in case the turkeys revolt. The sheriff asks for Jessica's help. The cops know the victim is on video and want to identify the other people in the footage to prevent a possible assassination attempt. To make matters worse, the store's surveillance footage from that fateful night is missing. Therefore, all hope lies in the testimony of witnesses who were there. Outside the station, Bobby waits for the girl. He admits that he arrived in the morning and offers to take a walk. The guy apologizes for cutting ties, but he has been going through a rough patch, and his career was put on hold due to an injury, but he's back and ready to help her. Jessica tells Bobby that her father still has a copy of the security footage on his computer. She wants to study it to help the sheriff. The conversation is interrupted by the appearance of Ryan. In the evening, the cowardly second guard packs up to leave town, but his passport suddenly disappears. 
but a mask appears. Realizing that he is not alone in the apartment, the guard grabs a bat and threatens the stranger. As he sneaks toward the exit, he is stabbed in the stomach with an electric knife, after which the killer throws a garrote around his neck and cuts off his head in one powerful motion. Grabbing it in his bag, he's about to leave, but suddenly, he realizes that it is necessary to be more humane, kinder, and carefully feeds the cat. In the morning, the guys receive the following message. The severed head of a security guard on the festive table. Jessica watches the video on her father's computer and makes the necessary printouts, which she and Bobby show to the sheriff. They identify many of the people from the tape and cast suspicion on Ryan. Earlier, he had said that he did not know any of the victims, but he greeted the trampled guard. After class, Jessica and her friends discuss this. They suspect that Ryan might be the killer, even though he seems harmless. The second suspect is Bobby. The murder started when he returned to town. Third is Mitch, who lost his wife. Evan suggests tracking them all down and do pew-pew, but the girls talk him out of it. The story shifts to Hanover High School, where a bully athlete encourages his classmates to work out harder. He is distracted by a cheerleader who lures him deeper into the building with clearly unseemly intentions. The girl begins to jump on the trampoline, showing off an excellent stretch and gradually undressing. She jumps facing the wall and doesn't notice how the maniac snapped the guy's neck cleanly. Then, he pierces the trampoline from below with a knife, from which the cheerleader runs into the blade again and again due to inertia. The sheriff informs the players that the game against Hanover has been cancelled for security reasons. He advises the youngsters not to go alone. Evan goes to get changed with Gabby, while Jessica waits for them. Around the corner, they are attacked by John Carver. Jessica receives a text message asking her to come to the locker room, but on the way, she hears some phone noises coming from the trash can. When she picks up the phone, she sees the killer in the reflection and dodges the blow. After escaping, she hides in the dressing room of a theater club, disguised among mannequins with wigs. As Carver looks around, she reaches for the scissors but drops the can of hairspray. When the killer turns around at the sound, he gets sprayed in the face and the victim escapes. After being questioned by the sheriff, Bobby and Ryan show up at the same time. The boys argue over jealousy and almost fight. Jessica snaps at both of them. Yulia's father, a simple Russian authority figure, arrives and picks up his daughter to take her to Florida away from the maniac. Scuba and Jessica go to McCarthy to buy a gun. He offers a magnum and a gold-plated Desert Eagle, but they decide on a less pretentious and inconspicuous barrel. On the way back, they call Julia, who is packing. Downstairs, a sheriff's deputy and the girl's father are on duty. Julia doesn't know that Carver has already broken into the house and knocked out the deputy and the father with tranquilizer darts. While live on the phone, the friends see the killer attacking Julia by sticking small wooden sticks in her ears. The madman continues the broadcast and shows the boys his captive girlfriend. They drive to Julia's house. Scuba threatens Carver with a gun, but he hides behind a hostage and shows a broadcast of the captives Evan and Gabby. When it turns out that the inexperienced sportsman hasn't removed the fuse, Maniac pushes Julia onto the powered circular saw and runs away. The friends are left with the body of a friend, who was almost disemboweled. After discussing the situation, the police decide to set up an ambush at the festive parade. Before it begins, McCarthy gives Jessica her father's lucky ring for good luck. Soon, the solemn procession down the main street begins. Jessica sits on the platform of the first settlers of the Mayflower and looks at all the people in Carver suits. Suddenly, the procession is stopped by demonstrators protesting the sale at Wright Mart. The cops chase them away and the traffic resumes. A man in a clown costume marches up to the turkey and blows its head off with a swift blow of his axe. Panic sets in and someone throws smoke bombs like in Counter-Strike. The platform with the settlers hit Uncle Sam on stilts. The cops hide the decoy in a car to drive away, but the clown puts the deputy to sleep with a dart. He throws a flash grenade into the cabin and after disorienting the passengers, puts them to sleep with darts and steals the car. Jessica's stepmother comes to her senses on the table. Carver butters her like a turkey. When he goes to check the oven, the woman escapes, forcing the killer to prowl the rooms with a pitchfork. Kathleen, like a master of hide-and-seek, makes her way to the stairs and up to the first floor. She tries to pry the nailed boards off the window with a can opener from the refrigerator that holds a bleeding but still alive cheerleader. Hearing footsteps, Kathleen grabs a bottle from the fridge and hides. Carver sees the bloody footprints but doesn't go into the next room, where a woman is lurking with a bottle. Instead, he randomly swings the pitchfork at the wall. Realizing that the ambush has failed, Kathleen runs out into the hallway and from there to the exit, but a well-thrown pitchfork stops her. In the next scene, she is in the oven browning to a crisp. Cops spot the start of the stream from an industrial area. Going there, they suspect that the maniac's hideout is in underground tunnels, where they go with special forces. But the search leads to a phone pointed at a laptop screen. The killer misleads them. Carver's captives come to their senses at the holiday table next to the bodies of past victims. With voice modulation, the killer offers to enjoy roasted Kathleen instead of turkey. 
Filling a glass with the blood of a cheerleader, the madman offers Evan to record a new viral video, for which he crushes the guy's skull with a meat tenderizer. Carver accuses those gathered of provoking a stampede in the store by their brazen behavior of sneaking in without waiting in line. He cuts off a piece of Kathleen and offers it to her husband to eat. At this point, Jessica, using McCarthy's ring, cuts the ropes and hands the ring to Scuba. When he gets free, they push the maniac away and escape. Carver gives chase with an axe, wounding Scuba on the way out, but Jessica manages to escape. The girl runs towards the town and encounters an unconscious and bloodied sheriff. She grabs his gun and goes looking for the killer. Bobby hides under the mask. Then the sheriff shows up, grabs the gun, and chases the pilgrim. The girl hears gunshots, and then the police arrive at the building. The cops put Bobby on the wanted list, and the captives are taken to the hospital. The sheriff offers to drive Jessica home, but she asks for time to recover. She pulls a burdock out of her pants and notices the exact same one on the sheriff's pants. Jessica guesses that he chased her through the thicket, and the man realizes that she knows. As he closes the door, he explains that he's in it for revenge. Amanda, Mitch's wife wanted to go with him. She was pregnant with his child, and the deadly crush provoked by her friend's antics deprived him of his family. The sheriff prepares a syringe with an injection to kill her, but the girl interrupts him with the traditional thanksgiving. Using a smartphone found as evidence, she broadcasts his confession. The sheriff lunges at her, but is knocked down by the aptly thrown hammer. Bobby rushes to help. The teens flee to a warehouse, where Jessica turns on the gas that fills the inflatable figure. They then jump into a pickup truck and try to drive away. The sheriff manages to secure the rope tied to the car to a pole, but the girl is not confused. She loads an old musket with gunpowder and her own bracelet to shoot the inflatable figure. The shot detonates the gas, cutting the rope and frying the mad cop. Firefighters who arrived at the scene found no trace of the body, only ashes. The police are certain that the former chief could not have survived such an explosion. After the experience, Jessica stays with Ryan. But at night, she has nightmares of a flaming sheriff lurking in the closet. But it's just a bad dream. And one more information, ladies and gents. Massachusetts state law doesn't allow stores to be open on Thanksgiving Day. Have a good day. Thank you watching, folks. Hope you liked it. You can check another interesting recaps in the channel. Don't get left behind. Join me for best movie recaps. Hit that subscribe button, follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Goodbye till the next recap.